Okay, well, thank you. And um, the previous speakers have said some of the things I have on my notes, so I will not repeat them. Uh, I agree with uh, almost everything that was said. Um, I think this is this paper is a valuable contribution to what is an expanding research literature on this topic. And as the uh, presenter said, uh, it's w been one that hasn't gotten a huge amount of attention in the political sphere. It's just been taken for granted that there is a shortage of, of scientists and engineers and there should be a, an expansion of mostly temporary uh, visas for that, that set of occupations. But the, the advocacy claims have been pretty much based upon weak or absent evidence, and there's now starting to be a body of strong evidence coming from a wide range of uh, researchers and organizations who don't have anything really in common ideologically, as far as I can tell. They're just looking at the data and coming up with roughly the same kinds of findings, in many cases saying they're surprised by the findings they came up with from the data. They had expected to find evidence of widespread shortages based on the presumed shortages that are sort of conventional wisdom, and they couldn't find it. They couldn't find that evidence in the data they looked at. Uh, the findings of this report are broadly consistent with most of the other research reports I've seen, um, and it says correctly, in my view, that the science and engineering workforce is important but small. That's a strange combination, but it's true. Very important, quite small. Uh, no credible evidence of general widespread shortages, but I would add, and they do say in there, that there is evidence in a few specialized fields. You can find at one time or another, in one place or another, you can find evidence that labor markets are tight. And you can see rising pressures on rising wages. In fact, you can see some companies taking action to prevent wages from rising by making uh, arrangements on the side for non-poaching kinds of agreements, which <laughs> indicates that it's illegal, of course, but it does suggest that they uh, had some evidence that wages were going to be or were rising, and they had to do something to keep that from happening. But generalizing to the nation or to the entire science and engineering workforce from those kinds of specialized circumstances is quite perilous but common because the claims are mostly coming from employers in those particular specialized circumstances. The other thing to say about science and engineering occupations is, th is that the career paths vary dramatically across these occupations. Um, by and large, uh, initial careers uh, are paying higher wages in science and engineering than with degree holders in what are called STEM. I'm going to get to that mo in a moment. I'll use it for the moment, the STEM concept. STEM graduates do receive higher wages on average than non-STEM graduates. Average real wages in most of these fields have not grown very much, however. So you have, again, it's this complicated. You can't just, you can't just make simple generalizations about it. By and large, higher starting wages, but slow growth uh, in wages over time. And I was um, pleased, I must say, in reading this report, which I just got uh, recently, so I read it quickly, that the data did actually turn up what anecdotally, and more than anecdotally, many of us were aware of, which is that petroleum engineering has gone from a backwater of engineering with some of the lowest average wages in engineering for 20 years, with petroleum engineering programs closing down because students were not interested in going into petroleum engineering, to the hot field of engineering, almost overnight, overnight meaning like in five years. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, nothing happens overnight in this kind of market. Mm -hmm. I was a, actually a little surprised, I mean I knew that that had been happening, I was, and reassured that the data showed that was happening because if the data had showed flat wages for petroleum engineers, I would have said, uh, Something wrong something with, wrong. yeah, something wrong here because we know the wages have gone up in petroleum engineering. 
But I was surprised, if anything, about how much the data showed they had gone up. Uh, by my calculation, where is it here? It's like From eighty-six thousand dollars in two thousand <coughs> average mean yeah. to one hundred and thirty-two thousand wow. in two thousand and twelve. That's su surprising. I thought it, if if you'd asked me, I would have said, "Oh, from eighty-five thousand to one hundred and ten thousand, that would have been what I would have gotten from other studies of petroleum engineering." This is really more than I expected. Yeah, it, there may be something going on. Well, it's not a huge sample size. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's so there, yeah but, but it, we do have twelve right. years of observations. Right. Okay, so it's consistent with what everybody in the petroleum field knows that. All of a sudden, meaning in f over a five to ten year period, it's become a hot field. And of course now what's happening is enrollments are expanding and graduate numbers are expanding and d new degrees or programs are being opened and so on. So we're going up now. After going down for 20 years, we're going up in the cycle there. Now I said I was going to say something about STEM and I'm increasingly uncomfortable with the term STEM. I use it in this book. Uh, I, I actually went through it with a search routine to find out how many times <laughs> I had used STEM. And I thought, uh, there was a count first, and I thought, oh my God, I don't remember using the term that many times. Turns out it was reading system <laughs> and, and counting the times I use system. If you took off the sys part of it, then, and I did use system a lot, it turned out. Uh, then I did use it, I forget how many times, but mostly quoting other people, thank goodness, because I think the term is uh, a, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder what it means. Um, the, uh, Lindsay Lowell mentioned uh, some studies coming out of Brookings that are showing, for example, that the STEM workforce, as they define it, they have their own definition of STEM workforce. Consist, is, uh, accounts for 20% of the U.S. workforce of 155 million people. Now that's an impressive number. And the 5% that the National Science Foundation, uh, under their definition, uh, refers to is uh, one quarter, obviously, of the 20%. And how did that happen? Well, they, I won't go through their methodology, but let's just say the outcome of their methodology is that people um, like auto mechanics are counted as STEM workers or the uh, very skilled uh, craftsmen who seem constantly to be working on my house in <laughs> Connecticut, uh, the wonderful carpenters who are very, you know, well paid and very, very good people, but they're count I think he would be counted as a STEM worker under these conditions. And I'm a great, I couldn't do what he does, but he doesn't really need a degree to be doing, he doesn't have a degree and he doesn't need one to be doing what he's doing. Okay, now what about immigration? I already said I have trouble with the STEM word, or the STEM acronym. The way this report uses immigration, the term immigration, is common English usage. So it means people who move to the U.S either permanently or temporarily, but not just visitors. So tourists are not included, short-term visitors are not included, but people who are temporary workers for multiple years are included as immigrants. The UN uses a different concept of immigrant, same English word, uh, meaning residents in a country for a year or more. Unfortunately, U.S. law doesn't use either of those definitions for the wor same word, immigrant. <laughs> immigrant in U.S. law means admitted for permanent residence, i.e. with a permanent, legal permanent resident visa, a green card. If you're not in that category, then you're what else? You're a non-immigrant. If you're not an immigrant, you're a non-immigrant. So many of the people in this study are not actually counted as immigrants in U.S law. They're counted as non-immigrants. Uh, I think since the paper is addressing law and policy, they might want to think about clarifying the language. I don't mean they should change their usage, but they might want to have a little box saying, you know, here we're using it this way, and the law uses it this way. Don't get confused. Okay, so um, I was asked to say a few things about this new book that I've just written. Um, that our chair mentioned, <clears throat> and the title, uh, Falling Behind, question mark, 
um, obviously indicates that it's focused on whether the U.S. is falling behind its competitors in, in science and engineering. And the simple answer is no. The U.S. in these fields is predominant globally. It's a leader globally. But it's not as predominant as it was in the first three decades, let's say, after World War II, three to four decades, maybe. Now, what's happened? Has the U.S. declined? What's happened is that the European countries, mostly European countries, that were devastated by World War II uh, have recovered, and they've become prosperous, and they've, become, they've come to uh, invest more substantially in science and engineering and in their university systems. They've expanded their university systems. I used to teach in Europe uh, for eight years, and, or four years, and studied there, and it's no, there's no question that the, if, for example, in the UK, the percentage of the cohort, age cohort going to university when I was a graduate student there was about 11%. And I think it's now getting on for 50%. So they have begun to catch up. So their growth, their, in, their improvement, if you will, in performance measures in science and engineering has been more rapid than the US. The US has been improving but more slowly from a higher level. They're improving more rapidly from a lower level. China is the most extreme case, improving very rapidly from a very low, very low level. And if you look at the curves, you'll see almost vertical changes in some of the measures in, in China, which look totally different from Europe and different from the US. Okay, so this book addresses this question of shortages as well. And the conclusions I was pleased to see in reading this report are broadly consistent uh, with this paper. No credible evidence of widespread national shortages, but a lot of variation across science and engineering fields, across levels of education, across time and across place. And that we can find, I, the book says, we can find indicators, as I said before, of undersupply in some fields and evidence of oversupply in other fields in science and engineering. And the fields go up and down. I've already mentioned petroleum engineering, but mechanical engineering is another example of a field that's gone up and down and up and down. The um, underproduction, where is there underproduction? Well, I think uh, this is arguable, but my impression is that we may be underproducing technical associates degrees, sub-baccalaureate degrees may be under producing. Uh, part of that is because community colleges, which are uh, a very important resource in, in this domain, have been increasingly squeezed financially because they are heavily funded by state and local governments rather than by research funding, which has been going up. But resources for community colleges has been not going up very fast. And some of them have said, well, it's more expensive for us to teach in a technical field than in a non-technical field. And if we want to keep open enrollments, we're going to have to squeeze down on the most expensive areas uh, in order to keep within our budgets. That's, that's a perverse outcome, uh, I would say. And the same, I think we could say, is underproduction in quality uh, master's degrees in scientific fields, although not in engineering. But in science fields, uh, the quality master's sector has sort of it, it did almost die out, and now it's reviving, but it's still got a long way to go to revive. And overproduction, where do we have overproduction? I don't think there's much dispute about this, although you'd not see it in the political discussions very much, is that we, have, we are overproducing PhD and postdoc levels in the biomedical sciences. And the leadership of the National Institutes of Health knows that and says that. It's not a secret. People don't know what to do about it but the system is overproducing relative to demand. And why, why does this happen? Uh, well, first of all, universities, the university system is relatively insulated from the labor market. It, it doesn't get good signals from the labor market, and in any case, it, it is slow, it's very slow. There are all these lags built into a university system like tenured faculty and department structure and department and internal politics, but also, um, the incentives within the system are increasingly research. And um, university 
faculty respond to incentives and they seek research funding. They need research assistance to do their research grant proposals and projects. And master's students and, of course, community college students aren't going to be research assistants very effectively. You need PhD students to be research assistants. And then research funding, the way we finance it, uh, actually provides the money to finance more and more PhD students and more and more postdocs. It's, it's, I can go into that at some length if you want. But what it means is that if research funding goes up, you'll have more money for PhD students and for postdocs, but not for master's students and not for certainly not for community college students. So that's part of the point of this book. And the result is that parts of the U.S. research enterprise, in science especially, and in engineering to a lesser degree, are structured to be unstable. Nobody really intended it this way, but, but because most PhD students and postdocs are financed by research dollars, it's 86 percent, by the way, uh, of graduate students supported by NSF, National Science Foundation, are supported by research grant funding, not by their wonderful graduate fellowship program, which is quite small. 78% of PhD students and postdocs supported by National Institutes of Health are supported by research grant funding, not by their training grant funding, which is very high quality, but small. What that means is if research funding goes up and down, you're going to get up and down flow uh, movement in the PhD numbers and the postdoc numbers, and that's what we've seen, with a lag, of course, with a delay. At the same time, graduate students get little information about job markets for PhDs and postdocs, uh, about career prospects. And uh, if American students decide, well, I I've heard it's not so great to be a PhD in biomedical fields, maybe I'll do something else, and there's a decline in interest or ap applications, but they, the universities really need more graduate students to be research assistants, they have unlimited access to international students. There's no limitation, no, get, no cap on the number of graduate students that can be admitted for graduate study to be financed by federal research dollars. So the graduate students from abroad don't have to pay tuition, and they get a stipend as well, in order to be graduate students in U.S. research universities. Meanwhile, you have other kinds of incentives that uh, cause universities to think about leveraging up, becoming more uh, active in research, uh, even if they don't have the internal resources to do so. Uh, what they, the incentives are uh, first that they want to try they, they try to maximize the percentage of salaries of their faculty who are paid or which are paid by grant funding, research grant funding. And I've already said they have an incentive to expand the number of graduate students and postdocs to work in their labs. And they also have an odd incentive to borrow money via mortgages or uh, bond funding to build new laboratory buildings and to renovate old laboratory buildings, which I can talk about. It's not nobody intended it this way. It's just it's built into the way federal regulations are written. There's an incentive to borrow rather than to own the building as equity, and that's the way the system works. So the result is a, a syst the system works fine as long as research grant funding keeps rising. If you have a stable increase in research funding of 5% a year, say, or 6% a year, everything's fine. But if it goes below 6% a year, according to one study, biomedical research in the U.S. is very unstable and goes into crisis. It needs 6% minimum annual funding increases to be stable. And this is harmful in many ways. So last point about the book is I go through in the book a surprising series of uh, cycles of past uh, alarms about shortages of scientists and engineers going back to World War II. The cycle is pretty typical. It's typically 10 to 15 years. Somebody sounds the alarm that there's a shortage of scientists and engineers or a looming shortage of scientists and engineers. 
The government eventually, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, responds by increasing the production of scientists and engineers via funding, or let more, la more recently increasing the visas for scientists and engineers from abroad. And then enthusiasm wanes, or the shortage doesn't appear that was forecast, and there's a bust. And a lot of people who are still in graduate school discover that there aren't the career paths that they had been advised they might be able to find or would be able to find when they graduate because it takes them enough years that they're, <laughs> they're behind the curve in terms of a 10 to 15 year alarm boom bust cycle. And there are five of these which I can describe later, but I think I'll skip over that now and I'm going to stop there. Thank you.